I'm doing this from uh, Southern California, uh, where many of you know uh, I used to live. I was a professor for a few years at University of California, Irvine, and so we decided to uh, return to our second home, so to speak, and uh, got here a couple days ago. And uh, I wasn't planning on doing any of this stuff over the next maybe five weeks or so to try to take a bit of a break, facing a lot of pressures. Some of them you probably heard. It's not uh, it's not been easy to be me at my uh, university. Uh, not looking forward to the prospect of going back, feeling rather uh, anxious about it, to be honest with you. We'll see what happens. But in any case, uh, when the Trump assassination happened, you know, it's, it's kind of hard to just go to the beach and uh, not think about any of these issues, even though <clears throat> one can argue, hey, I'm Canadian, this is not my, I don't have a dog in this fight. But of course, that's not true. First of all, they say when uh, the U.S. sneezes, Canada catches a cold. We are inextricably linked, and I'm certainly, I'd like to think of myself as an honorary American. I studied in the U.S. I was a professor at many universities in the U.S., Cornell, Dartmouth, <clears throat> UC Irvine. Uh, the US, I probably love the U.S. more than many Americans do. Certainly Americans who uh, are of the Democrat persuasion, I hate to say it, but that's the reality. In many cases, people who vote Democrats uh, define themselves by their loathing of the evil America. Well, I'm not one who shares those views. And so I thought, you know what, let me just get home and do a, uh, <clears throat> an X spaces. It's been a while. So today I want to talk about first the, well, the actual assassination attempt and then what that says about Trump, and then also link it to uh, the Secret Service and uh, how they went about, quote, protecting the, uh, the leading contender for POTUS. <clears throat> so I'll start with uh, the assassination attempt. Uh, you know, many people have written to me and some just posted uh, you know, publicly that, you know, if they weren't, if they weren't sure whether they were going to vote for Donald Trump prior to what transpired with the assassination attempt, now they're sure that they're going to vote for them, for him. <clears throat> and of course, I completely understand that because let's stop for a minute and think about it. I mean, I'm in the public eye. I receive a lot of, I mean, 99% of it is love, but 1% of hate from a very large number is still a lot of hate. I face all kinds of pressures, but uh, I am certain that it's not 0.01% of the hate, the threats, the animus that someone like Donald Trump receives, right? They've impeached him twice, completely bogus stuff. <clears throat> They've indicted him four times. On completely, I mean, I mean, this is not, you know, me just, I mean, short of you being a ardent Trump hater or a ardent Biden supporter, no serious person would think that any of the uh, impeachments and indictments were anything serious. I won't rehash them here. So they've gone after him economically. They've gone after him judiciously. They've gone after him politically. And now, of course, they've gone after his life. And does this guy cower? Does he go in a corner and suck his thumb? No. As there's blood coming from his ear, coming out of it, gushing from his ear, maybe gushing is too strong a word, but as, you know, I mean, he came from within a few centimeters of having his, his brain blown out. He's saying, fight, fight, fight. And that image, of course, has become, <clears throat> will become an iconic image. So let's suppose you were saying, look, I'm, I'm from Mars. I'm coming here. I, I don't know anything about the machinations of Democrat versus Republican, but is this guy exuding the types of traits that we would want in a leader 
in a neighborhood that's very dangerous, right? The world is an ugly place. The world is a dangerous place. And I know it's cliche to say, you know, the leader of the free world, but the United States, for all of its recent weaknesses, remains a bastion for, you know, other societies. And so the leader of the United States should be exuding strength, vigor, courage, valor. Did Trump exhibit those yesterday? I mean, it'd be difficult to imagine how one would exhibit greater resilience, grit, and resolve, right? I mean, many of you know that in the Parasitic Mind in Chapter 8, <clears throat> I talk about activating your inner honey badger. And I know that some of you maybe are bored of me repeating this, but for those of you who've never heard me say this, the reason why I use the honey badger as the symbol of grit and courage and ferocity is because, well, that's exactly what the honey badger is. It has been ranked as the most ferocious, fierce animal in the animal kingdom. There are a lot of fierce animals, but it's the fiercest. It can be stung by a million bees. It doesn't give an F. It can be suffocated by a huge constrictor. You can go and check these clips on YouTube where it is close to death. It's nearly completely asphyxiated. It is able to get itself out of that death grip. And rather than run away, what does it do? It says, I'm coming for you, big. I can't remember if it was a boa constrictor or a python, but it was a big constrictor, huge. It says, I'm going to kill you. This is when it was almost out of oxygen, when it was near, as, about as close to death as you can get. It goes back, it kills the constrictor. And then as it's dragging it away, two jackals approach to try to steal the, the now the dead snake. And now it fights them off. So it escapes sure death. Once it escapes sure death, it doesn't, you know, instantiate its instinct to flee. It says, you tried to kill me. I'm now going to kill you. And then it rebukes an attack from several dangerous predators. There are other clips of the honey badger, you know, fighting off six adult lions. The honey badger is the size of a small dog, but that's how ferocious it is. Well, guess what? Donald Trump is a honey badger. You don't like his style. You don't like his elocution. You think he's cantankerous. You think he's uh, boorish. Okay, fair enough. That's all good. But as I explain in the parasitic mind in chapter two, there's something called the elaboration likelihood model model in psychology of advertising. It basically says that when advertisers are trying to persuade consumers or viewers of a particular message, we know that consumers can either use what's called what are called the peripheral cues or 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 central cues or cosmetic cues versus substantive cues. So for example, if I'm if I'm trying to uh, advertise a perfume to you. Well, usually I won't start saying things like, well, here are the eight physiological reasons that Harvard anatomists have said that this is the best perfume. Because in this case, when you're trying to sell a perfume, you want to engage the consumer's peripheral system. So you just show a beautiful girl with flowing hair on a horse and she's riding the horse and then you just say, mystère, right? or whatever the, the brand name is of the perfume. You're not trying to activate the central cognitive processing mode of the customer. On the other hand, if you're trying to say to customers, uh, here are the eight reasons why you should choose our hedge fund. Well, usually you won't show a sexy girl on a horse and say, buy our hedge fund, because you're trying to activate the central, the substantive cues that are going to engage your cognition rather than your emotions. Now, why am I saying all this? Because as I explained in the parasitic mind, and please, if you haven't bought a copy yet, what are you waiting for? It is the mind vaccine that you should be reading, that you should be gifting to your friends. And I don't say this because I'm going to make an extra $3 off the sale of another book. I say this because we are fighting a battle of ideas and it is important that you arm yourself with the right 
mind vaccine against all the nonsense. So why am I take, talking about all this? Because regrettably, when it comes to choosing presidents, most people, despite the fact that this is an incredibly consequential decision, will end up using their peripheral system, their cosmetic cues. Oh, Obama has a radiant smile. Oh, Obama is black. By the way, he's only half black. Oh, Obama has a mellifluous voice. Oh, Obama has such a radiant smile. He speaks with such uh, eloquent cadence of a Southern Baptist minister. Okay, and at no point did I say, here are the seven substantive reasons why I like Obama. Or similarly, if you hate Trump, you'll say, he's boorish, he's obnoxious, he's cantankerous, he's not presidential. Cosmetic, 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 cosmetic. You didn't say, I don't like him because of his fiscal policy. You didn't say, I don't like him because of his immigration policy. See, thinking is too hard. And therefore, it is best to rely on cosmetic cues. Well, cosmetic cues are great when you're buying perfume. Cosmetic cues are not great when you're choosing the leader of the free world. So, when it comes to the assassination attempt that just happened, if you were unsure about the resolve, the resilience, the grit, the toughness of Donald Trump, boy, you're brain dead. You're basically Joe Biden. You're, you're about as brain dead as Joe Biden. Because what more can you see? What evidence can you see than someone having taken a shot to blow your brain and you're standing there saying, hey, my shoes, my shoes, fight, fight, fight. Okay. Now contrast this to Biden. Contrast this for a minute. Now, yeah, I don't want to start with the preface of, oh, but you know, he's a human being. We all age. Yes, but th there's no room here for sentimentality when it comes to a person who's going to have a profound influence on millions or billions of people. Joe Biden doesn't know if he's an avocado or a human being. Joe Biden can't tell if his wife is his wife or his pet chihuahua. Joe Biden doesn't know if it's night or day. Joe Biden doesn't know how to get off the complicated stage where you walk down the stairs. Joe Biden can't finish a sentence. Joe Biden would never be your babysitter. Joe Biden wouldn't be your pilot. Joe Biden wouldn't be your neurosurgeon. And yet, nearly half of the people in the world or in the United States say, doesn't matter, I'm still going for Joe Biden. That's what a parasitic mind is. It's saying, I don't care what is the amount of evidence that you show me. I am never voting for that boorish pig. And therefore, here I'm going to bring in a saying from Arabic, which some of you have heard me say in the past, getting drunk by smelling the cork of the wine bottle. <clears throat> One of the beautiful things about Arabic is it's a very evocative and flowery language. Getting drunk by smelling the cork of the wine bottle means, yeah, I mean, it's not usually applied for this context. I'm, I, I transported it for this context. It means basically that you're a weak constituency, right? You don't, you don't actually need to drink wine to get drunk. You just take a whiff and you're already drunk. Now, how do I use it in my context? I'm basically, look, take the cork and now smell the cork of Obama. My God, he's so, he's so, such a mellifluous voice. He has such a radiant smile. Now let's smell the cork of Trump. He's grotesque. He's ugly. He's fat. Right? So therefore, I'm getting drunk by the cork of the wine bottle rather than actually doing the hard work of thinking, of actually drinking the wine. Right? Now, Life is signaling. What do I mean by that? I'm going to come to in a second to, to the Secret Service and, and so on. When you go into a prison courtyard for the first time, what happens? Everybody sees the newbie and they size him up. They size him up how? They look at how he walks. Does he walk erect and confident? Does he look like he's somebody not to be messed with? Does he look like he's weak and meek? 
and they very very quickly are able to judge whether this new convict is going to be someone that is either a prey or a predator someone that we can go after and we can go after the new kid on the block in many ways hey he could become your woman he could wash your laundry he could become your new girlfriend he can you can tax him 50 percent of his lunch meal or you can quickly size him up and say this guy looks like he's no nonsense and of course people will test you and depending on how well you do in these tests you're either going to have a very very unpleasant time in prison or hopefully do your time with your integ integrity and honor and dignity intact let alone other parts of your body so therefore life is signaling refers to the fact and by the way i talk about signaling theory in my consumer psychology work right where i'm when i apply evolutionary principles to explain things like conspicuous consumption right we use products as sexual signals this is why the great majority of ferrari owners are male irrespective of which country you look at because men use fancy cars as a sexual signal now that doesn't mean that women don't use sexual signals but they'll use other sex specific products as sexual signals so signaling is found in all sorts it's found in the prison courtyard it's found when we go out looking for a mate it's found across animal you know many many animal behavior so now let's apply it to joe biden versus donald trump the world the courtyard the prison courtyard of the world is made up of some really nasty folks north korea and china and all sorts of islamic thugs and uh, uh you know putin and the, and the rest of the nasty folks now they're watching and they say who's going to be president of the united states and should i be scared does anyone genuinely think that any person who has design on doing bad things in the world is going to look at joe biden as president and say holy moly this guy scares me i'm definitely not going to fool around or do anything that would piss him off now i'm not suggesting that donald trump is uh, plato i'm not suggesting that donald trump is the toughest you know prisoner the aaron aryan brotherhood in the prison gangs but he certainly is someone that is unpredictable and contrary to what some morons think when they think that unpredictability is a bad thing it's the exact opposite that's correct when you have the red button and you have donald trump sitting and going eeny meeny miny mo catch the tiger by the toe meaning that he's going over the red dot or the red button that will launch the missiles and he signals to the world that you don't want to mess with me you don't know what i can do i'm a brash cowboy guess what people are not dumb people are darwinian beings they understand signaling and therefore they say hey i better not go into ukraine because donald trump is president but when avocado brain becomes president i could go into ukraine i better not do october 7th because president trump is a maniac i will do october 7th when avocado brain is in power okay so all the morons who you know have come after me through the years oh you're you know you're a trump this trump that i'm canadian i can't vote in the u.s campaigns but i'm driven by this thing called truth and truth is not american truth is not canadian truth is not indigenous truth is truth so the mechanisms that i'm explaining to you now the importance of signaling in geopolitics is not something that is restricted to whether i'm american or not or whether it's trump or biden it's a universal law of nature right so there is if ever there was any doubt that anyone certainly let's let's call it the undecided or the independence if ever we weren't sure you weren't sure whom you should vote for boy did the trump assassination attempt close it for you and if at that point you still end up voting for joe biden 
then you deserve everything that befalls you. Because, yes, elections matter, and your vote is sacred. Many, many people have died so that you and I can vote in so-called democracies. And so think carefully. Don't get drunk by smelling the cork of the wine bottle. Okay, now let's, two more things I want to talk about. Number one, the Secret Service. Now, I'm not, I'm hardly one, I'm, I'm very uh, epistemologically humble, meaning I know what I know and I know what I don't know. And I don't like to enter territory where I speculate uh, or, or at least pretend that I'm, that I know something when it's really speculative. So I don't want to weave conspiracy theories uh, about you know what happened and so on i don't think that it was an inside job i don't think that but what i do think is that it is very very likely that the secret service has become politicized and, and i'll talk in a second about diversity inclusion and equity in the secret service but let's let's stop for a minute here and talk about Many of you have heard me mention this before. I've discussed it in the parasitic mind and I've discussed it in all sorts of other venues, the difference between deontological and consequentialist ethics. Deontological ethics are absolute truths, right? So if I say, for example, uh, it is never okay to lie, <clears throat> that would be a deontological statement. If I say it's okay to lie to spare someone's feelings, that would be a consequentialist statement. And as I've explained on many occasions in the past, for many, many things in our lives, it is perfectly reasonable to be a consequentialist. But when it comes to foundational principles, the pursuit of truth, freedom of speech, the presumption of innocence, journalistic integrity, those should be deontological statements. And one of the major reasons why we are in the current quagmire that we're in, in our current zeitgeist, is that many people have violated deontological ethics. Now, why am I talking about all this? The Hippocratic Oath in medicine is a deontological statement, right? It says, above all, my main responsibility as a physician is to heal people, irrespective of their religion, irrespective of their political identity. My first job when I don that, if literal, if not proverbial, white coat is to help whomever is presented in front of me. Therefore, medicine or the practice of medicine should transcend politics. Being a secret service agent should transcend politics. You're above politics. You have sworn an oath to protect the president of the United States. And that is irrespective of whether you share the president's, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, politics or not. Hold on one second. Yeah, sorry. Uh, so if you're in the military, your job is you, you're sworn to a particular oath. If you're a police officer, you're sworn to a particular oath. If you're a district attorney, you're supposed to abide by the Constitution. And what has, of course, happened, you know, in today's world is that, and I hate, I'm sorry to say it, but the, the Democrats have weaponized all these things, right? So now you do have physicians who say, I would never, you know, uh, I could never take care of a Republican voter. By the way, you see it all the time with uh, Islamic societies where they'll literally say, the physicians, I don't take care of, you know, a Jewish patient. A patient. By the way, I received confidential information from McGill University, the number one university in Canada, one of the top universities in the world, from their medical school, where, you know, third, fourth year medical students or residents had been posting stuff. These are Islamic uh, students and residents where they were posting stuff precisely violating the Hippocratic Oath, where they're saying things about Jews and about, tree, you know, so on, that is completely beyond the pale, right? Yes, of course, we can all have political positions, but if you hold a position where your politics have to be transcended by the, the solemnness of the position that you have, whether you're a judge 
or a physician or a secret service. Well, of course, I would say academia should be the noblest manifestation of that. But regrettably, as I explained in the parasitic mind, academics are the purveyors of all of the parasitic ideas that we now see everywhere, right? So academia should precisely be about the deontological pursuit of the truth. Of course, that's not what many academics are. Now, why am I saying all this? Because I suspect, again, here I am, I am speculating, but I suspect that uh, the Secret Service probably did not pursue the protocol of protecting Donald Trump with the alacrity that is expected of them, right? It seems to not make any sense that there could be a line, a, a, you know, a, a, a line to to the to to Donald Trump that's about a hundred meters away, or I don't know exactly how far it was. That wasn't completely guarded. Usually, you go to these places two weeks ahead of time. You've got all kinds of protocol to ensure that there is absolutely no conceivable way that any human being could come remotely close to anything resembling approaching a president or a leading candidate or a former president. And the fact that here you had people saying, hey, hey, policeman, hey, Secret Service, look, there's a guy over there with a rifle. So I don't think it was a, an inside job, but it was, well, eh, you know, maybe I won't put my life on the line to defend this grotesque convicted felon okay now so that speaks to the idea that this deontological uh, bent that you should have when you hold these positions has been completely violated and that causes huge schisms in a enlightened society because what holds those societies erect is precisely that these inviolable deontological principles, well, can never be violated. And once you say, yeah, sure, I'm a physician, but not for a dirty Jew. Yes, yeah, sure, I'm a Secret Service agent sworn to protect the president with my life, but not if he's Donald Trump. Sure, I believe in presumption of innocence, but not for Brett Kavanaugh. Sure, I believe in journalistic integrity, but not when it comes to... Uh, allowing the story of Hunter Biden to go out because then Donald Trump will win the presidency and on and on. Oh, sure, I believe in freedom of speech, but not when it comes to the ogre existential threat called Donald Trump. Then you're entering very dangerous territory. Okay? Now, the director of the uh, Secret Service is some woman who apparently is all into die, diversity, inclusion, equity. Uh... I was mentioning a few minutes ago the importance of signaling. Historically, when we imagine the archetype of a Secret Service agent, they're intimidating looking guys, they're big guys. Yes, of course, a bullet will kill a big guy. So you don't have to be a huge guy in order to fire a gun or in order to jump in front of a bullet to save a president. But when it comes to the types of traits that you're looking for in a secret service a five foot three overweight woman yeah i'll say it i'm hardly one who's afraid to tackle sacred sacred uh, uh cows uh, i don't want a five foot three overweight woman as a secret service i mean did you see how they were reacting did that seem to you like they knew what they were doing? Now, evolutionary psychology tells us that there are many sex differences. There are some tasks that women consistently outperform men around the world. There are many other tasks where men consistently outperform women around the world. And there are other tasks where men and women are indistinguishable from each other. And what allows us to determine when men are better than women, when women are better than men, and when there are no difference between men and women, is this little thing called evolution. It's this little thing called biology, right? We are a sexually dimorphic species. We're a sexually reproducing species made up of, wait a minute, sit down, this is going to be controversial, 
made up of two phenotypes called male and female, when it comes to physical traits, when it comes to physical strength, when it comes to risk-taking, when it comes, comes to heroism, that doesn't mean that women can't be heroes and that women can't be... I can guarantee you that today, every single professional female MMA fighter can beat the living daylights out of me because I'm a 59-year-old man who is not an MMA fighter. The fact that all of those female fighters can probably beat me up in five seconds doesn't imply that men are not astronomically stronger than women, right? For the exact same reason that men are taller than women, even though female WNBA players are taller than most men, right? So the fact that your aunt Linda is taller than your uncle Joe says nothing about the, the veracity of the statement that men are taller than women. So when it comes to Secret Service, no, it shouldn't be a laudable goal to have 30% of agents be women. I want the best to be Secret Service. If all of them happen to be women, which is not ever going to be the case, then let them all be women. If all of them should be transgender indigenous people, then let that be it. But it's based on meritocracy. And when it comes to secret service, only a fool and a PhD in women's studies from Wellesley thinks that female secret service agents are on average going to do as good, if not better job than male secret service agents. That's why throughout all of recorded history, the warriors have typically been male because men have this little thing called testosterone. And this little thing called testosterone has tenfold greater baseline in men than it does in women. Why is testosterone important? Because it drives your aggression. It drives your risk-taking and, and other downstream effects like courage, like heroism. That's why most people who win awards for heroism are not 49-year-old, 5'3", overweight, pear-shaped women, right? On the other hand, when it comes to memory tasks, women consistently outperform men. That's not because the, 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 you know, uh, there is a, uh, a conspiracy to keep men's memories down because women have evolved certain sex-specific abilities that makes them perform on memory uh, location tasks much better than men. There's nothing sexist about that. Men bench press more than women. Men jump higher than women. Men run faster than women. Men take more risks than women. Men are more interested in being heroes than women. Men are more aggressive than women. Therefore, when it comes to Secret Service agents, it is likely the case that short of you trying to implement the cancerous diversity, inclusion, and equity, if we go on meritocracy, it is very likely that in almost all cases, men are going to outperform women when it comes to Secret Service duties, certainly field duties. Okay? So therefore, Having this idiot, this woman uh, director of the Secret Service saying that it is important that we have X number of women, X number of this and that, that's how you end up with the situation like you did yesterday. Okay, That's why you end up at UCLA with medical students who can't tell where the heart is versus where your eyes are because we applied diversity, inclusion, and equity and admitted people that have no business in being in medical school, okay? Meritocracy is a foundational deontological principle of enlightened societies that define the West. Once you get rid of that, you are carpet bombing what made the West great. It's built on meritocracy, not on irrelevant, immutable characteristics. Boy, it should be obvious to people. And yet, all I see all day in academia is a rejection of meritocracy. Okay? And finally, I wanted to say a few uh, 
quick comments about uh, the VP pick of Donald Trump, J.D. Vance. Just a few days ago, I was sitting with a gentleman in Newport Beach having a coffee, and uh, I, I, I said, J.D., I've actually said it to, to a few people, that I was hoping that J.D. Vance would be picked. As a matter of fact, last year, we were in Newport Beach. We went to the Newport Beach Public Library where they have a bookstore, and I bought J.D. Vance's book. This was last summer. I still haven't read it, the uh, Hillbilly Elegy, which of course was eventually turned, I mean, not only became a best-selling book, but also turned into a movie. I'm, I'm now even more keen to read it. Uh, J.D. Vance strikes me as exactly the type of American uh, exemplar that you want to see. A military guy, went to Yale Law School. Uh, we don't know if we should hold that against him in today's uh, reality, but certainly is a smart guy, uh, anti-woke, well-spoken, dignified, you know, as an author, a best-selling author, uh, and signals to the world that he loves the United States. When When I'm sitting in Lebanon as a young boy and I'm thinking about American folks, and I'm thinking about America, I'm thinking about somebody like J.D. Vance. I'm not thinking about uh, Joy Behar. I'm not thinking about Whoopi Goldberg. I'm not thinking about all the CNN and MSNBC folks who just exude a hatred for everything that America stands for. J.D. Vance does stand for that. J.D. Vance is a walking neon sign that says, hey, America still has a future, and I will try to defend it. Now, the other thing that I, I posted a, a tweet earlier today when I found out that uh, J.D. Vance was, uh, was going to run on the ticket with Donald Trump, I said that this is a really good move because one of the things that worries me the most about the so-called MAGA movement and Donald Trump is you don't want it to be just a doorstop. In other words, just a four-year bleep where we had a reprieve from all the wokeness or an eight-year bleep if he wins in a second term. You want this movement to be long-lasting. You want the pushback against all the crazy, progressive, anti-American, woke, parasitic nonsense to be combated for generations to come. Remember, it took, depending on the parasitic idea, it took between 40 and 80 years of brainwashing, first in the university settings and then in the greater society, before the leftist maniacs won the culture war. And it's going to require, regrettably, almost as much time to win the culture wars. And therefore, in having a young guy like J.D. Vance, and there are others, Josh Haley, and Tom Cotton, and there's a whole bunch of other guys that are real American guys, uh, you know, love the United States, that exude all of the sort of American cowboy that you, that the rest of us immigrants, when we, when we hope that we could come to the United States, we're looking at. We're not looking at Kamala Harris. We're not looking at Joe Biden. We're not looking at Hillary Clinton. They're globalists. See, they're, they're better than you. You are deplorables. You are the great unwashed. You're nativists. You care about United States first. Yeah, so what? Every culture should define itself by being proud in who it is. But only somehow the West, only somehow America should hate itself as a sign of its progressive uh, street creds? No. You want the JD, J.D. Vances of the world to have a long career ahead. So there you have it, folks. To summarize... The assassin, I thank God that Trump wasn't uh, assassinated. And I say this, be, not, I mean, again, not because I've got Trump posters in my bedroom, which we use as foreplay before my wife and I engage in sexy time. But imagine what kind of hell would have been unleashed had the assassin been successful. By the way, did you see some of the tweets that went out where people were saying, oh, too bad it wasn't successful, only a few inches. 
There is one woman at UBC, University of British Columbia, Canadian University, that's, um, I hope that she's regretting what she said, because uh, yes, of course, you have freedom of speech. Yes, of course, she should uh, espouse any position that she wants. But I don't know if you saw her. She She's a professor in the medical school at UBC. I don't have the exact tweet in my hand. She said, oh, too bad, missed by only a few inches. Now, imagine you are teaching. Now, look. I get a lot of people that come after me that say horrifying things to me. I mean, some of the some of the Jew hatred that I have been exposed to, I mean, would make the Nazis feel uncomfortable in the level of Jew hatred. And yet I never wished death upon these people. I never wished cancer upon these people. I never or was never gleeful in knowing that they might, you know, uh, something might befall them. Because I'm, because I have humanity. Because I think that even people who are levying horrifying things to me, they're misguided. They're horrible people, but they're someone's son, they're someone's daughter, they're someone's husband, parent, brother, sister, and so there is room in my heart to uh, to at least not trigger the kinds of animus that I saw from people when the assassination attempt was unsuccessful. What kind of person must you be to write something like that? By the way, earlier I was mentioning about the the Hippocratic Oath. Do you know that the Israeli physicians, when they found out that Sinwar, the, the Hamas guy, had a brain tumor that would you know that would result in him dying, operated on him, saved his life and the way he thanked them was to then be a mastermind of October 7th. So look at the difference. You want to know the difference between the societies, between the, the Palestinian society and Hamas and the Israelis? The Israelis were going by the deontological principle that if we are physicians, we will go out of our way to uh, cure even our most avowed enemy. And then that avowed enemy, when he is saved by the Israelis, rather than having a softening in his heart, rather than saying, my God, I was brought up thinking that the, the Israelis and the Jews are monsters and demons and they have horns. But now I realize that they're full of love and compassion and they saved my life. So maybe I need to change my ways. No, he doubled down. He said, hey, you know what would be a good way to pay them back? October 7th would be a good way. That's all you need to know about the difference. That's why I defend Israel. That's why I defend the Jewish people. It's not because, you know, being Jewish is number 900 on my list of things that define me. Not, not that I'm not proud to be Jewish. It's part of my heritage. But you could have gone through my Twitter feed or X feed and I would have gone years without you have any, ever seen anything about me being Jewish. But after October 7th, it became really important to touch base with my Judaism because those who did October 7th really cared that I'm Jewish, just like the ones who made us run really fast out of Lebanon in 1975 really cared that we were Jewish. And so... I defend Jews and I defend Israel, not because it's what I wake up every morning thinking that I want to do that day. It's because those who wish to do me harm and do harm to my children and wife for no other reason than being Jewish, uh, well, then that suddenly makes me care about these issues. So there you have it, folks. Thank you for attending this impromptu meeting. Tomorrow I'm doing Tom Bilieu's Impact Theory. It'll be the third time that I'm doing uh, the show. Uh, and I'm also doing two shows hosted by Prager University. And I'm also doing Diary of a CEO, which is a British show. Uh, so I've got many, many shows happening in Southern California. There might be a few others that are happening. So this is both a work trip and a bit of a break. Uh, if you wish to support my work, you can do so in many ways. You can uh, share my content. You could subscribe to my YouTube channel. It's free. You could subscribe to my podcast. You can uh, 
uh, if you are in a position to donate, you can donate through one of the many portals, Patreon, PayPal. You could subscribe to my exclusive content on X. You could buy my books. There are all sorts of ways that you can support my efforts. Uh, I love the United States. I love being here. I am an American in spirit. I hope to one day permanently move to the United States because regrettably, as much as I love Canada, as much as I'm grateful to Canada for having given us a home, Canada is no longer a place that is uh, safe for Jews. This is not hyperbolic. It's the absolute truth. And certainly Montreal is way ahead on that curve. And so wish me luck. If there's any way that you can support me, consider doing so. It matters, people. Some of us who take all of these risks do so for no other reason than the deontological principle that it's the right thing to do. Reciprocate. Do your part. Wishing you all a fantastic day. Uh, peace. And I'll talk to you soon. Cheers.